Okay. <laughs> I would like to take the AT from at the Boston Foundation for bringing us all together tonight. I would like also to thank everyone for coming tonight and I look forward to a discussion about how we can all work together to help these poor enforce the basic rights they need to enforce to escape to the cycle of poverty and vulnerability uh, to be sister. Finally, I would like to thank the AT Fund and Karen and Sarah for the generous support of our work and the work of so many other important projects in Haiti. I am particularly impressed by the AT Fund's thoughtful approach and its emphasis on empowering Haitians to be the solution to the Haiti's problem. I grew up poor in coming of Verit, the same region, in the Atiwani Valley. My home, like many Asian homes, had no electricity. Water comes from an irrigation canal that is now infected with cholera. Often, there was enough food, not enough food. Most of my friends and family members in Verret never got a chance to learn to read. Two good fortune, good fortunes, hard work and sacrifice of my family, especially me, especially my mother. I go to school, become a teacher, and then lawyer. But I have never forgotten where I come from. I am driving every day to use the privileges I have had to change the unjust cultures that keep my family and friends in varied and millions of Haitians trapped in a cycle of poverty and disempowerment. I have managed, managed the Bureau des Avocats International since 1996. The office mission is to make the justice system work for the majority of Haitians who are poor. We initially work on large symbolic cases of political violence. Before I arrived at BAI, the office described its approach as a job starting the justice system. It's work on individual cases. Given the police and giving the police and the prosecutor information and take support to move those cases for trial. The BAI use most international staff, and although it's worked with individual victims and their family as clients, and it did not work extensively with organizations. This was like trying to jumpstart a car with a dead battery, a broken engine, and no tires. The problem with this approach became apparent in the June 1996. In June 1996, trial of the assassination of Justice Minister Gimarawi. The BAI had helped locate witnesses and evidence and got a trial dead set. But the trial was a disaster. The evidence was not strong. The pastor did not present it well. And both the defendants are acquitted. The BAI relies the model of just working on individual cases 
will not work in, is not working in. So they brought me in and we develop a new approach, adapt to 80s reality. We kept working on individual cases, but we had another <coughs> layer of work that involved supporting good movement so that they could enforce their own right and apply pressure on the system as a war. Our biggest, our biggest case was the Waboto massacre case, which went to trial in 2000. We worked on that case for four years, doing legal work, but spent more time helping the victims organize and training them to assert their own rights. The victims participate in court, conduct press conference, organize demonstrations, and watch songs. This approach was successful in the Raboto case, where we were able to convict 53 soldiers, militaries and paramilitaries, including the top militaries and paramilitaries leadership of the 1991 and 1994 a de facto dictatorship. In a trial, the trial is by observers as fair to the to victims and defendants alike. Three of the militaries I command were deported from the US to face charges in the Wagodo case, including the highest ranked officer ever deported from the United States on human rights grounds. Along the way, we work with many judges, prosecutors, police officers, who were building Haiti's justice system, though their efforts, training on the Waboto case, and other training programs, although for years, the trial was longer than we had the trial we had in 2000 was far better than we could have imagined in 1996. <coughs> but, but, in 2004, the U.S. president, who did not like Haiti's president, economic policy, kidnapped our president, and much of 80s progress and justice was wiped out. Everyone who was in jail in the Raboto case was let out. The prosecutor had his home and office law burned down. The judge has beaten. Several of our clients in their house burned. One was brought to the police and execute. The 2004 coup d'etat demonstrated no matter how well Haitian work to build their country, progress in Haiti was not sustainable unless the international community respect the human, the, the Haitian rights. This is true in many areas besides justice, even President Clinton, former President Clinton recognized that U.S. trade policy in my Haiti agriculture in my hometown of Verit and throughout Haiti by flooding our markets with soup dyes, rice, which force Asian farmers out of business. This realization forced us to add another level on our work, which focus on making the international system respect <coughs> the Irishian rights and reaching out to the citizen of the powerful country willing to engage to make own country safe for democracy, justice, and development in Haiti. So we, we established our US partner, 
the Institute for Justice, Democracy, and Aid. Along with IJDH, we distribute information about human rights in Haiti, bring grassroots voices, voices to the UN, to the US Congress, and any, any else that decisions about Haitian rights are made, and engage with international justice system, especially the American Commission on Human Rights. How many people have seen this photo? How many of you? Oh, okay. It is the National Palace, destroyed by the earthquake, and still in the same condition until now. Most estimates of earthquake death in Haiti range from 200,000 or 300,000. Does Anyone know how many of those deaths happened in the National Palace? How much? Two, one. One? Not that many. <laughs> the answer is three. Okay. The answer is three. Now, you don't get to 2,000, 200,000 deaths when people die by two or three, you get to 200,000 by people dying by 1,000 or 10,000 when entire neighborhoods collapse, which is what happened in the ports on the hillside above province. To a large extent, the deadly of those neighborhoods was a failure of the rule of law. The law on the book said it was illegal to build on those hills, precisely because they were dangerous. But those law were not enforced. Haiti had building codes that help ensure that building we stand shock, but the code were not enforced, especially in our in poor neighborhood at the zoning and building code being enforced. Our earthquake could have, could, could have killed a fraction of the amount of this care. To show this, we need only to look at the much more powerful earthquake that hit Chile, a country that is poor, but not as poor as Haiti, a few weeks later. The quake in Chile was 500 times stronger, but 200 times more people die in Haiti. This week, this week's quakes in Turkey was about the size of Haiti's. But as of this evening, the death toll was 534. The people who died in the poor neighborhoods above poor place knew that the house were unsafe. But move the family there because they had no other choice. They had no other choice because they, are, they were poor. As everyone in this room knows, Haitians are not poor because they do not work hard. They are poor because they are unable to enforce the basic right of those who us who are not poor are unable to enforce. This include contract rights. Small <coughs> merchants, especially, are always losing their business because they cannot enforce their contract. 
with more powerful actors, Asian workers are unable to enforce the employment right they need to allow the hard work to help them out of poverty. Father, I am not required to support their children, condemn mothers and children to a life of hardship. And violation of the right to education condemns another generation to the same fate. If an important part, part of the problem of Haiti pause is a violation of their basic right, part of the solution must be those rights. In our work to enforce those rights, we need to work with all three levels. First, we provide direct services provision, helping individuals to enforce their right. Second, we support movements fighting for systemic change. In two cases, two cases designed to make the systemic change. Third, along with our grassroots partners in Haiti and our friends outside the country, we pressure the international community to respect the Haitian human rights. One example of how we do this is our housing rights advocate, advocacy project. We fight illegal eviction in Haiti internal displacement camp. About a year ago, there were over one million earthquake survivors in Haiti internal displacement camp. There are now officially about 600,000, but unofficial, many of the people who have left the camp in the last year are still homeless, living in the site of road or hill, with no services, a little COVID community. Hundreds of thousands of people have been evicted from both private and public land. Haiti has processes to, for legal eviction, but I've never seen those used for the camp. Each time the eviction is carried out without a court by police, criminals, and bulldozers. Those evicted are never given the adequate alternative accommodation or support to find their own housing. Our first level of response is providing direct services. We represent camps, communities, and negotiation with landlord and court and in court. But this alone will not surface because landlord, including mayor, simply ignore the court. Our second level of response is to support movement and work on the system right changes. We provide know your right training to the camp communities and work with camp communities to organize press conference and demonstration. This allows the displaced people to fight to their own right in negotiation with the landowner or police with the government. Along with 24 communities and human rights group in the U.S., we filed a petition with the International and American Commission on Human Rights. Last November, the Commission recommended a moratorium on illegal eviction and that the government respect the rights of displaced people and camp. The government has not fully complied 
with the order, but we are still working on it. Yesterday, I was in Washington for a hearing at the commission. The government ignored the hearing, and we expect that now the commission will increase the pressure <coughs> on Haiti to comply. We also work with our Asian and U.S. partners to file a report on eviction with the UN Human Rights Council. Two weeks ago, I traveled to Geneva uh, to, part to participate on hearing in the council. The third level of our work encouraged the international communities to, res to respect the Asian rights. Yesterday in Washington, we had a briefing with Congress to push the U.S. to stand up for the right of the people. We apply the same approach uh, to several other projects. Our current priorities are responding to rapes in ITP scale, helping to persecute, to persecute Jean-Claude Duvalier, and our collaboration with partners in health to respond to Haiti's unjust and deadly prison conditions. Everyone can get involved in the fight for justice for Haiti's poor. I suggest four things. First, stay informed. There is a lot of good information about Haiti, especially in, on internet. I will make two recommendations, IJDH, 